certain analogies uh, between uh, structures you can define on graphs uh, and uh, Riemann surfaces. So in particular, I will be talking about ways uh, of developing a theory of devices on graphs that parallels classical theory of devices on Riemann surfaces. Uh, and uh, so my talk uh, doesn't require uh, pretty much any background in algebraic geometry or in graph theory. So <laughs> I think that's one of the advantages uh, of, you know, connecting different subjects in this way. So uh, I will start by defining uh, basic concepts in theory of Riemann surfaces, devices, uh, uh, which any, anyone who knows algebraic geometry probably understands uh, better than me. Then I will t explain how to translate these concepts to graphs, and in particular I will introduce uh, a chip fine game, a game which allows one to manipulate with these uh, objects fairly naturally. I will uh, state how in these terms one can formulate riemann roch theorem and uh, give an outline uh, of the proof, uh, so fairly big chunk of the proof. Uh, I will talk about uh, other divisor-related concepts which are well understood uh, classically but not so well uh, on graphs. Uh, Weierstrass point will not a theory. I will talk about maps between graphs which are analogous to classical concepts uh, and maybe about metric graphs in the end. So let me uh, just summarize uh, the classical definitions, what are Riemann surfaces, what are devices on them. So s if uh, you are not comfortable with Riemann surfaces, think of them as uh, just being uh, surf usual surfaces in three-dimensional space, two-dimensional surfaces, such as sphere and a torus, uh, which are locally uh, behave like complex numbers. So you can define a, a complex valued uh, functions which are locally as functions from complex numbers to complex numbers. In particular, you can define meromorphic functions which are analytic uh, except they can have poles uh, in certain points. And uh, a divisor uh, just measures, uh, a divisor of a function uh, just measures what zeros, what roots and poles are present in a function. A divisor in general uh, is, is a sum of finitely many points uh, with integral coefficients and uh, I will denote them uh, as written there by D. Uh, so P in parentheses uh, here means a point and P a coefficient of this point. So some points on the surface are assigned in, in integers only find many of them. Device associated with meromorphic functions will count zeros of this function with multiplicities with positive coefficients and poles of this function with uh, negative coefficients. So s say uh, if you have uh, on a sphere uh, which you think of, of it as complex numbers with infinity a function uh, z squared it will have zero of order two uh, at zero and Pole of order two and infinity, so its divisor would be this con have a support these two points. Uh, then uh, one can associate uh, to a given divisor, so given combination of points on a surface, uh, a linear space uh, L of D, space of functions which are f divisors of which are bounded uh, by this fixed divisor D in, this, in a way that the sum uh, of of this fixed device D and device of a function is non-negative. So a sum, of course, uh, of two devices is a natural thing. You just sum them formally at every point. Uh, if there's, you think, uh, if device is not defined of it, you think it as a combination as having coefficient zero at this point. So you can add two devices by adding them point-wise and being non-negative means having non-negative coefficient at every point. Uh, and uh, so what else I need to define? So device, a device associated with function uh, L of D. Uh, effective divisor would just mean a, a non-negative divisor. Degree of a device, a degree uh, of a device is just a sum of coefficients at all points. Uh, so uh, I will, okay, so this 
I, this is copy pasting from the part uh, about graphs. So, <laughs> uh, so what I uh, want to say is uh, that uh, the degree of a device is the sum of NP, sum of coefficients. Uh, and Riemann-Roch theorem says that, uh, so on a, on a Riemann surface, there's a specific divisor called canonical divisor, which is defined. Uh, and Riemann-Roch theorem, it describes a dimension uh, of this linear space associated with a given divisor fairly well. Uh, it, well, it gives an identity involving this dimension and dimension associated with another divisor, which is obtained by subtracting this divisor from a canonical divisor. And it says that the difference of these two dimensions is degree of a divisor plus one minus g, where g is the genus uh, of the Riemann surface. <coughs> so that's classical Riemann axiom. Let me uh, demonstrate you an application just to get a feel of what this theorem is about, a small application uh, of this classically, like a typical trick uh, of how one obtains certain things using Riemann axiom. Riemann axiom is a classical, fairly pe really powerful tool uh, in algebraic geometry. So let's think of a uh, one-dimensional uh, Riemann surfaces. They are one, not one-dimensional, uh, genus one Riemann surfaces. So this, these are just tori. And so commentators, when they think about, uh, about tori, they think about taking a square and gluing uh, the sides together on one side and sides together on the other side. That's pretty much what tori are uh, in theory of Riemann surfaces. Also, you take a complex uh, plane and quotient it by certain lattice. So you get, uh, you get the parallelograms with sides identified. And uh, on every Tori there is uh, a unique uh, function, uh, function with a meromorphic function with uh, double pole uh, at zero and no poles everywhere. It's called Verstas function. Uh, now, if you have a function with double pole at, at a point, uh, one can generate a uh, a lot of functions which have a pole of order at most uh, some fixed number, at most six uh, at, uh, at this zero from this function. You can just take, take function derivative, you can multiply uh, function with derivative. So you can get uh, uh, seven, uh, seven different, uh, from one function sev of this pole of order two, seven different functions with pole uh, of order at most six. And by Riemann-Roch theorem, you know that the dimension uh, of uh, the function space with poles and zeros bounded in this way uh, is uh, at most six. So you will get that that uh, this Verstrass function on a torus uh, satisfies a certain uh, equation, uh, a cubic equation that, uh, that relates the function and its derivative. And in particular, from this you can have, uh, you will have real realizations of complex theory as cubic plane curves. But I mean, the lesson to take from this, the, the lesson I, uh, uh, I get from this slide is just uh, how one can, uh, by knowing dimension of certain linear space, one can deduce uh, uh, non-trivial uh, information about identities relating functions. Okay, and so I'm close to the end of the first half. Uh, I just need to reformulate Riemann-Roch theorem uh, in a form that would be make more sense on graphs because the classical formulation doesn't have, doesn't quite translate. Uh, so I can say that two divisors are equivalent if their difference is a divisor of meromorphic function. So I'm just factoring everything uh, by, uh, div by the space of divisors of meromorphic functions. Uh, so in particular functions, uh, divisors uh, equivalent to zero are exactly divisors of meromorphic functions. And I'll define uh, uh, this body uh, with every divisor I will associate the set of all divisors no that are, non, that are effective and equivalent to this device. So I look at all effective devices equivalent to a given one. Uh, so 
it will have a projective structure. It will have a dimension, which is the dimension of the linear space associated with device of minus one. Uh, there is an equivalent definition which will make sense on graphs, and I'll return to it. And uh, so this, uh, this parameter dimension uh, of this projective space body, uh, I don't know why I call it body, uh, of this project, it, it also, uh, you can get an equation uh, on it which w gives another formulation of riemann rock theorem. Okay, now, now I want to st try to say uh, most of the same things on graphs. So let's start with saying what a graph is. So, well, uh, if you go, if you start, uh, I mean, if you understand Riemann surfaces but uh, not, don't understand graphs very well, you, you can think of, so an, uh, the right way of going from Riemann surfaces to graphs in this, in this setting is to well, take this uh, surface uh, uh, in three-dimensional space and make the, the part of the space that it bounds smaller and smaller, make the surface into a series of thin tubes which will eventually, which will eventually degenerate to edges of the graph. But, so, starting with graphs, graph is just a set of vertices, some discrete, some, and uh, a set of uh, pairwise connections between, between these vertices points. Uh, we are not allowing loops, we are not allowing an edge to have both ends at the same vertex. We are allowed, uh, we are allowing two edges uh, join, join the same pair of vertices. And every, all the graphs in this talk, uh, they will be connected, meaning there would be a path between any, you, you can somehow get along edges in between any two vertices of the graph. Okay, now I want to define meromorphic functions, devices, devices of meromorphic functions, genus, device equivalent, canonical device, all of these things I want to define on graphs. So what would be a meromorphic function, a uh, good concept of meromorphic functions on graphs? So uh, I, I, would, I want to think about graph as being just a set of vertices and uh, edges denotation, so there's no... Uh, no continuous structure on graph at all. So any function on a graph would be a function from the vertices. And uh, it turns out that the right, uh, right uh, set to, to map to would be just integers. So we'll, we map from vertices to integers. Uh, and devices, well, so there are linear combinations of points, so they're same. They're also maps uh, from vertices to integers. We're just thinking about them a bit differently. Uh, what is the device of a function? So device of a function at a point measures how non-smooth uh, the function is at this point. So non-smoothness uh, here would be how much the value at this point, at this vertex, differs from the neighboring vertices. So we take a, a vertex and we add differences between value of a function at this vertex and, or, and each of its neighbor. So along all edges going from this vertex, we measure the difference uh, of value of function at this vertex and the neighbor. And so that's, so... Is that just a number or...? A it, so it's, it's uh, okay, so let me explain the uh, notation. So, it did, so this, I, I would... But I would denote by d of v uh, the value of a divisor at the vertex v. So divisor of a function at a point v is a number, and divisor is a divisor. It's a function from vertices to vertices. So somehow you can think of it, if you have a vertex of degree 2, and you have a function that's defined on it, that's linear, that somehow that really that have value one and uh, value zeros and two on, the, on its neighbor, so it doesn't have any bands. And the value of a divisor at this point would be zero. Uh, uh, and if it if it bands, it's uh, so you can think of it as being uh, so positive as being a pole uh, if it's maximum, and, uh, uh, zero if it's minimum. Genus of a graph, ge just like genus of a surface, it's the number of holes in it. It's uh, the dimension of a cycle space. But for a graph, dimension of a cycle space, and this is actually the definition which we'll be using, uh, is a quantity which one can calculate easily as the number of edges minus the number of edges plus one. 
two devices are equivalent in the same way as before. Two devices are equivalent if the difference is divisor of some Nehemiah function. And the canonical divisor, uh, it describes somehow the structure of, of a graph. So on every vertex, uh, uh, the value of canonical divisor is degree of a vertex minus two. The degree of canonical divisor in particular, uh, as it is classically, is twice uh, genus uh, minus two, one can. Cal calculate this. Um, what is the what's the meaning of this tilde uh, for the further line uh, divisor f is what does that mean? Uh, here it's it's adjacent. Adjacent, okay. Yeah, it means there's an edge between the two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, everything is connected but this tilde uh, means adjacent means means there is an edge from W to V. So then you have a double edge, do you count it twice? Uh, yeah, I count it twice. So this, so this notation somehow is, is not, not completely precise. Yeah, I do, I do count it twice. So really, I should write a sum over h. Is this mathematical compared with this uh, divisor curious that we define? Oh, no, sorry. Is this mathematical? Yeah, I mean, this is just the definition. Okay, so you just need it. <laughs> it's OK, so but let me now say it in a way uh, that is easy. So in a way that is, makes everything uh, easy to think of a, a way which uh, makes uh, graph theories comfortable and uh, so cheap time game uh, let me so it's called cheap fine game because very similar games uh, class class type non graphs called cheap fine games what we will uh, what uh, the way we will describe it would be a dollar game not cheap fine game uh, so yeah, I think that, I, I hope dollars are okay. I change it to euros sometimes, but, cha <laughs> but changing it to one quan would be, right, yeah. it's, it wouldn't make sense. Uh, okay, so, uh, so we have, so think of vertices as people, and uh, edges are connection between people, so, so, say neighbors or friends. Initial configuration gives every person some number of dollars, some amount of money. Uh, could be negative, uh, that is so people could be in debt. Uh, a move in a game is the following. Every, a, a person gives a dollar to each of its neighbors. So it cannot give to individual neighbor, but it can give a dollar to each, to each of its neighbors. It doesn't have to have the amount, so it, it can become negative in the process. Uh, or a symmetric move, it can take one dollar from. From, from, from each of its names. So the game is completely re reversible, and it's a solitaire game. So it's just, uh, well, one player. We decide what's going on. Uh, you collected euros there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one dollar and giving one euro. Oh, OK. So, yeah, so, so I, I was trying to correct uh, everything. Uh, OK, no. Well, so, so the exchange rate is one to one. <laughs> Uh, and our goal is to take every vertex out of debt, to, 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 to obtain a configuration equivalent to a given one so that n n nothing is positive. So, so this game in a, so uh, I don't have internet connection. Right? Uh, so in terms of devices, uh, it's the following. So these are the previous definitions. So you can think of configurations as devices. They're exactly the same. And equivalence defined before is actually equivalence defined this way. So to, you can get from one configuration to another by using these moves if and only if these are actual equivalent devices on a graph. And we want uh, to, uh, uh, so winning the game mean obtaining an effective device equivalent to a given device. So we want to answer, so let's answer the question for which initial configuration we can win the game, which means what are devices uh, for which uh, the set of e efficient, effective devices equivalent to them is non-empty. In particular, let's answer the following question. Given a graph, what is the minimal number of dollars so that if there is that much, if the total sum uh, of dollars of all the vertices uh, present is at least this number, then uh, we can always win the game. So what is the degree of a device that guarantees uh, the, that uh, the corresponding 
uh, set of effective devices is non, uh, non-empty. Well, so classically an answer to this question uh, when the linear space is non-trivial uh, for every device is it if genus at least G, if uh, the degree is at least genus, and so here is, it's the same answer. So it's always, oh, it's again, so it's always possible to win the, to win the game if we have at least, uh, at least the G uh, number of H minus number of H plus one dollars present, and the, on every graph there exists a configuration where you have one less dollar and you cannot win. So that's, uh, uh, let me reformulate it uh, in, uh, in terms of devices. Uh, so it says that uh, if device has a degree at least G, then there's an effective device equi equivalent to it always, and there exists a divisor on every graph of degree G minus 1 for which there are no effective device equivalent. So that's true on Riemann surfaces at a classical theorem. That's a, an implication of Riemann rock. And that's actually a fairly substantial part of Riemann rock. And uh, I'll, I'll prove it. It's, it's really natural and easy for graphs. But it requires this technical concept. Uh, so a key in the proof is de defining a reduced divisor. So Let's define it. Let's fix a vertex uh, in a graph, V0. A divisor would be called reduced with respect to this vertex. If first it's non-negative on every other vertex, could be, could be negative on V0, but non-negative everywhere else. And the following is true. Uh, so uh, the second condition is technical. Let me explain what it means. It means, so if we take a non if we take a any non-empty set of vertices that does not include V0, and we try, and everybody in this set tries to land one dollar to its neighbors, then what will happen is that everybody in this set will send one dollar along an edge going out of this set. And I want to say that it's impossible, uh, a device is reduced if it's impossible to do that so that everybody still stays non-negative. So there would exist a vertex in this set for the, the, which sends more edges outside of this set than it has money, than it has dollars, than the value of devices. So this definition is actually kind of like a definition of G-packing. Well, it's almost it's exactly the definition of G-packing function by Kostnik and Shapira. Uh, they use it uh, in uh, algebraic combinatorics uh, to uh, to also to get monomials in some reduced form. So examples, uh, a div this divisor, uh, so let's look at a cycle, six vertices uh, joined on a cycle. Uh, so the value in each vertex is the value of divisor at it. This device is not V0 reduced because this vertex can send uh, uh, one dollar to each of its neighbors still remain non-negative. This is not V0 reduced because uh, Okay, so forget this V0. Uh, because these two vertices, each individual cannot send dollar and remain non-negative, but both of them could send a dollar outside and they will remain non-negative. And finally, uh, this uh, device on the right uh, with values zero everywhere, just one in this vertex, it is V0 reduced. You cannot optimize it. And the key statement is that uh, if we fix a vertex and every device is equivalent to a unique V0 reduced device. So uniqueness, I wouldn't prove, and it's not relevant for our theorem, but existence, uh, let, let me show you existence. That every device on the graph is equivalent to a unique, to a V0 reduced device. So let's obtain this V0 reduced, so we need to satisfy two conditions. We need to be non-negative on every vertex except V0, and we need to satisfy the second uh, and if so first, how do we obtain uh, non-negativity everywhere except for V0? Well, let V0 lend a lot of money everywhere. I mean, it cannot lend everywhere. It can only lend to its neighbors, but everything is connected. If it lends enough to its neighbors, then uh, the neighbors can lend outside, etc. Eventually, everybody will be non-negative. And then uh, we need to satisfy the second condition. Well, so let's now start absorbing money back towards V0. If there is a set violating this condition, let it send the money outside. We'll still satisfy the first condition. And let's continue this until, uh, 
until we have to stop. Why do we have to stop? Well, I mean, it's not, it's not that hard to see. So eventually, I mean, there's only a finite am amount of money outside V0 eventually uh, uh, we should stop absolutely money. So actually, I mean, this is, uh, uh, this is the whole proof. Let me, let me show you t t this on example. So. Uh, let's look at this small graph and uh, the divisor has values as shown. So first V0 will like to make everybody non-negative. So let it send uh, a lot 6 to its neighbor and then its neighbor can send uh, 1 to everybody else to make everybody non-negative. And now we need to get rid of the sets uh, which, are, which violate these conditions that have too much, too much money. So say uh, here a set of three vertices. Uh, it can send money outside, remain non-negative, but after that, uh, it is V0 reduced, so we obtain V0 reduced divisor equivalent. Okay, now let me show that uh, every divisor, uh, if, it, if, if I have at least this much uh, dollars, then I can make a divisor non-negative. Well, uh, so let me... Uh, obtain an ordering uh, on vertices of a graph uh, is full. So let me take a divisor, uh, take V0 arbitrary, make the divisor V0 reduced. I'll prove that if the, uh, if the degree is at least G, uh, then uh, what I'll get as V0 reduced divisor would be uh, effective. So if it's not effective, uh, then what happens? Then the only vertex at which I can have a negative value is V0. So V0 must have a negative value. Now let me look at all vertices except for V0. Uh, so s one vertex in this remaining set must have less dollars than the number of edges from this vertex to V0. So here it's this vertex. Let me call it V1 and look at the remaining set. Again, one vertex uh, must have less edges, go must have more edges going from it than the number of dollars it has. Uh, so let's mark it V2. So it has two, uh, two edges going outside and only, only one dollar. And v so we can, we can number in this way all vertices of the graph and we will see and because of the way they are numbering, the value of divisor at each vertex would be at most the number of edges going to it from it to vertices with lower numbers uh, minus one. So it would be strictly less than the number of edges going from it to the vertex with lower numbers. So it must be minus one. And summing, summing these inequalities over all vertices, we get uh, that the degree must be at most genus minus one. So we get, we get uh, that this that our degree condition uh, is violated. And that's the whole proof. And the thing is, so uh, it's almost the whole proof of uh, riemann rock theorem for graphs. So I mean, that's somehow a bit surprising. I mean, it's, it's easier than the classical thing. Well, I mean, maybe it's not a bit surprising, right? Because, I mean, graphs, graphs e i, i, toy, a toy model. It's, it's nice. It's, it's not surprising, it's nice that it is, it is really a elementary short. Now let me uh, formulate, uh, so how does one state riemann rock theorem for graphs? So we need this, so let me go back to the, to the original thing. So previously we had this linear space uh, which had dimension, the space of functions uh, that are uh, well, that uh, have these devices at least uh, minus uh, our fixed device. Now we cannot assign, a, there is no good affine or projective or any kind of structure uh, for the functions that have divisor at least as big as given device. But we can, uh, we can uh, translate this measure uh, the second measure of space of effective devices equivalent to a given one uh, because so equivalently classically it can be stated as the maximum number so that however we subtract an effective divisor uh, of 
this degree from our divisor, we still get something that has a, that is equivalent to an effective divisor. And that's, so actually it still makes sense uh, in, uh, uh, in chip firing, in, in the sense of a chip firing game, uh, it, it's actually fairly natural. So now it's not going to be a solitaire game, uh, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a game with an opponent. Uh, uh, so a rank of a divisor would be a maximum number so that if opponent comes, so sees our divisor, takes away k dollars from somewhere, we still can win the game, however, however he does it. Uh, and canonical divisor is already defined, and uh, so with this definition of rank, uh, the classical riemann rock the exact analog of classical riemann rock theorem holds. Okay, so that's the riemann rock theorem. What other, so I mean, the theory of, I mean, of divisors on Riemann surfaces is way deeper than, is m much deeper than riemann rock theorem. So there are lots of other questions that are asked and answered uh, in G classically. So let me talk a bit about some of them. So, general question. One can ask this on surfaces, on graphs, and uh, so under what we want to describe, uh, so what are parameters that we have? We have genus, uh, which is uh, somehow sh describes complexity of our graphs for us. We have degree uh, of, of a divisor, and we have this R rank of a divisor. So we want to see what are the connections between them. So under which conditions uh, we have that all of divisors or some of divisors of given degree have rank uh, at least uh, this this number, and maybe devices of specific structure. So in particular, Raymond Rock theorem says that uh, every, what does it say here? So it says that uh, uh, every device of, rank of degree D has rank at least R if and only if uh, this uh, inequality uh, below holds. Uh, let me, so let me say something about other similar uh, questions and what do we know about them. So Verstrass points, so classically there is a, a concept of Verstrass points, uh, which is a point so that if we take a device that's concentrated on this point, has value g on it, but value zero everywhere else, then uh, the rank is at least one. So we know that if we have, uh, by, by inequality on the previous slide, uh, we know that if we have if you put g plus 1, uh, a device that's g plus 1 has value g plus 1 at any given point, 0 everywhere else. It always will have rank 1, at least 1. Uh, and so the question, and there's those points, if you don't need g plus 1, it's sufficient to take g at this point and get rank 1. Uh, so every human surface of genus at least 2 has at least one Bergstrass point. And it's not true for graphs. So uh, at this point, it starts. Uh, shows that, I mean, graphs are structures that uh, have too much continuity taken off from them. To, uh, to get Verstrass points on every graph, one needs to introduce additional points on top of vertices to the graph. One needs to introduce points along edges. Uh, so in particular, let's, let's do the following. Let's subdivide every edge equal, equal number of times. So let's take uh, any edge of the graph and put uh, k minus 1, uh, k minus 1 u vertices along this edge uh, and call this, uh, so we just, so just subdivide everything equally and uh, so Matt Baker who introduced me to, to this uh, topic and who, uh, his, his main motivation uh, to study these objects, it comes from, from number theory, and he has a toolkit of to translate some statements uh, from uh, number theory to statements on graphs and some results. So in particular, he can show that uh, on every, f for every graph, there exists some k, so that after we subdivide uh, this graph uh, enough times, we get a Verstrass point. The thing is that, I mean, it's a, right, in terms of chip firing game, and uh, 
This is, I mean, the statement is purely graph theoretical statement. The proof of Riemann rock theorem is purely combinatorial. But this theorem, the proof of it is, I mean, you take a, f a result on, uh, on certain uh, finite fields and translate it uh, to, to graph. So it, it's not combinatorial at all. Uh, and so recently, uh, uh, Amido Mini and Dan Kral and uh, somebody else perhaps they obtained a proof of this that is vaguely combinatorial at least. Uh, and I mean, of course, one also might want to try to just understand the discrete graphs. Uh, when do, when do uh, graphs have Bernstein points? Is it true that if they are sufficiently non-trivial, have big genus, then they always have Bernstein points? Uh, and so. Again, on Riemann surfaces, the answer to a question, what is a, what is a, a sufficient condition on G, D, and R so that we can always find not every, but some divisor of degree D uh, and rank, rank at least R on every graph uh, with, so it's a climatic number, it's the same thing as genus, just uh, graph series prefer systematic numbers. So, so on Riemann surfaces, there is an inequality uh, that tells us uh, when, uh, when we can find such a divisor. And Matt Baker conjectures that uh, one can, that the same inequality, so that here there is no difference, that this condition uh, is, is uh, sufficient uh, so nece necessary and sufficient for graphs. We don't know it either way. And he can prove using the same translation argument that under this condition uh, the result is satisfied uh, if you are allowed to go to subdivisions. One can find a divisor uh, with, uh, with given rank uh, on some uh, subdivision uh, of a graph. So but as, as far as I understand the, the, the proof in classical case, it requires uh, uh, doing something in high dimensions. And, that's, uh, and this is something that completely absent from our techniques now. So I mean, we cannot do, I mean, we don't know what's, how to, ab I mean, graph is one dimensional object, how to do anything in high dimensions. Okay. Uh, how bored are we? Uh, so let me talk about, few more things. Uh, so another concept, so wh wh when you look at uh, Riemann surfaces, you also not just think about Riemann surfaces, a very important, uh, important concept is maps about Riemann surfaces. I mean, just general paradigm of modern mathematics is supposed to be that if you are studying objects, you should be, what you are really should be doing is studying maps between those objects. So let's, so let's try to see what are maps between uh, uh, graphs which correspond to maps between Riemann surfaces which preserves, preserve all this nice structure like degrees, well, like, like uh, equivalence of devices and things. Well, uh, so they're called harmonic morphisms. And so harmonic morphism is a map from a graph to a graph. So it maps vertices to vertices. It maps edges, either to edges or to vertices. So it can collapse to ends uh, of, of, of an edge. Uh, and it should, uh, it should be regular in the following way. Uh, when, uh, when you look at a vertex uh, and look at an, so it, it's a map from a graph G to some other graph G prime. If you look at a vertex and look at its image and a certain edge uh, incident with an image, then the number of pre-images of this edge should not depend on, the, on, on this choice. So somehow the number of, uh, of layers, of fibers, uh, of, of, of the maps that are mapped onto every edge incident to a given vertex should not depend, depend on the choice of an edge. Uh, so here's a picture which should be an example. So the graph on top is mapped uh, to a graph on the bottom. Uh, 
it's supposed to be a harmonic morphism uh, of degree uh, three. Uh, so on every, oh, okay, yeah, I don't, didn't define degree yet. So, uh, so these red lines uh, indicate which vertices are mapped to, to which vertices. And so what it, does the condition say? So let's look at, say, this vertex. It's incident to four edges uh, in the bottom picture. And for every uh, edge in the bottom, there are exactly three edges from every Uh, there are exactly three edges from every vertex on the top that are mapped to this edge. Uh, is this true? Well, so it should be true. Okay, so right, it's just the way I'm saying the definition is right. It's not. Right, so if, if, you, if you look at a vertex on the bottom and the edge on the bottom, you look at all the edges that are mapped to this edge, not, not incident to a particular vertex, just all the edges. So, so uh, and under these conditions, uh, devices and everything behaves nicely. So if you have a divisor, you can just extend the map on vertices linearly to get a map from devices to devices, and equivalent devices are mapped to equivalent devices. One can uh, translate lots of this theory. And some results that are either equivalent to classical results or say some things uh, about uh, graphs, uh, nice, uh, are true. Let me, let me mention a couple of theorems. So, Number of sp so the size uh, so right, so the n number of devices equivalent to a given device by uh, the by the classical theorem is just the number of spanning trees uh, in, 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 in is this true no it's not true. Sorry, just to lag. Okay, so, yeah, so the number of spanning trees somehow is, is so, so f f uh, I mean, I kind of did not present enough definitions uh, for this theorem to make, to make a lot of sense uh, given what I said before. I mean, the number of spanning trees is actually the size of a finite group uh, that one can associate with a graph Jacobian of a graph, which is kind of like Jacobian of a Riemann surface. It's a, it's a class of all equivalent, it's a group of all equivalence classes of devices uh, of degree zero. Uh, it's going to be a finite group. So, and uh, in particular, if in, in all the series, if one maps one graph to another by harmonic morphism, then one gets that the number of spanning trees in the original graph is divisible by the number of spanning trees in the resulting graph. And this theorem tells you that the number of spanning trees in a graph is even if and only if we can map it to a trivial graph with even number of spanning trees, uh, to a graph with just two vertices joined by two edges. So somehow it's this funny theory tells us, uh, gives us a description, a structural description uh, of uh, graphs uh, that uh, satisfy certain combinatorial properties. So this is a theorem that comes out of this theory that has nothing really to do with any algebraic geometry. The second theorem uh, is, uh, an, again, an analog of a classical result of a description of hyperelliptic uh, uh, Riemann surfaces. So there is an important class uh, of surfaces called hyperelliptic uh, for graphs uh, one can, uh, which are surfaces which allow a divisor of degree 2 and rank 1. And those uh, are exactly surfaces that have an have a involution uh, so that the, well, 
and have a say degree two holomorphic map to a sphere or an involution so that the quotient is a sphere and all of these conditions uh, I mean all I mean all of this translates nicely into graphs you get instead of instead of a sphere you get a graph of genus zero which is which is a tree so it's a cyclic a cyclic graph so in classically you have only one surface here you have a whole class of graphs trees and okay uh, the final part of the talk uh, is uh, is connections uh, of all this to tropical geometry uh, in particular so one can give one can get a metric structure on a graph so on top of so this is uh, just some advertisement for tropical geometry uh, so on 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 top uh, one can look at a graph at this discrete set but one can also put a metric structure think of not only vertices being the points but also having points along the edges edges being uh, pieces of lines uh, of length one and by looking at metric graphs so by graphs where uh, vertices uh, where you also have points on edges one gets more or less exactly tropical curves and this is this is uh, a view of tropical curves that's helpful here and so devices now are just sums of linear combinations of points. Some of them are vertices. Some lie somewhere on the edges. Uh, what are equivalent devices? So previously, a vertex could give a, a dollar to each of its neighbors. Now you can think of equivalence as being you take, a, take some amount of money at a point and start pushing it in all directions at equal speed. Uh, so in particular, one can see. So let this represent a metric graph, this represent a divisor. One can get an equivalent divisor by taking this two and pushing one in both directions from this point at equal speed, get an equivalent divisor like this. So and so divisors can be defined on metric graphs, non tropical curves in this way. And so and once we have a definition of equivalence of divisors, we have a enough structure to be able to formulate uh, all the theorems and in particular uh, Gassman and Kerber uh, and Michalkin and Zharkov proved riemann rock theorem uh, on tropical curves uh, uh, using this definition. Uh, the thing is so it's in particular so Tropical ge geometry is supposed to be a simplification, one of the purposes of tropical geometry is that it's supposed to be a simplification of algebraic geometry and uh, so somehow it's supposed to be discretized enough to, so that mo mo more concepts become simpler and provable and then they could be lifted up to classical case. So here what happens is that you take an already proven classical result, you put it, push it down to tropical curves but even so for a while even on tropical curves they couldn't prove uh, the riemann rock theorem and so further discretization to graphs allows one to understand uh, I mean allowed us to understand the what's going on there and then uh, this these people lifted lifted the res at least some parts uh, of the result to get the argument in tropical case so the proof I mean Gassman and Kerber's proof is uh, a limiting argument uh, on top of the finite graph result and Michalkin Zharkov uh, is a is a translation uh, I mean it, it's it's partially can be sort of as translation of the proof uh, and uh, actually one can just mirror this the same proof uh, in this result so let me skip a bit of that uh, and tell tell you about but further research groups. So there is a Riemann theorem now on tropical curves on graphs. These are the same theorem. There is lots of similarity between them. One can understand why is it the same theorem. But the classical theorem, the same statement, has completely different proof. And somehow there is not a lot of justification why is it the same theorem. Why? I mean, both of them are true, but why? Is it coincidence? I mean, it shouldn't be, right? 
And uh, so recently, and I, I was trying to do something, but I, I don't understand, I mean, I don't understand sufficiently classical picture, and I cannot mirror what I understand. So nothing like, like ser duality, if someone knows what it is, uh, it makes sense on graphs. But recently, so Anouda Mouni and his student, they, uh, they managed to generalize what we are doing on graphs and to, 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 to get uh, some very, very robust uh, methodologies that generalizes what we are doing on graphs to, to class of lattices. And sometimes the Riemann Rock theorem is true, sometimes it's not, but one can understand the conditions why it's true. And in particular, one can do a limiting argument there and obtain a classical result. I haven't seen the, I mean, it's work in progress, but I believe that now somebody somewhere understands why there is the same theorem. Then, of course, there are higher dimensions. So there is, riemann rock theorem is generalized to a much more general object. But uh, so in higher dimensions, uh, it would be some work with simplicial or polyhedral complexes. We don't know how to define a relevant uh, object there. Uh, and so Bernd Sturmfels mentioned that one of the problems there is that if you have a tropical curve, if you have a one-dimensional object, it's clear what a graph it corresponds to. It's clear where to put vertices. If you have a tropical variety of high dimension, it's not clear how to put a simplicial complex or polyhedral complex structure there. That's, so that's one of the problems. Uh, so, and analog of for tropical varieties, I mean, some, somehow, again, it's, so there are beginnings of intersection theory now. And then, from, for graph series, it would be really attractive to, I mean, we have this powerful machinery, and some of it translates to statements about graphs. One can actually already prove statements about graphs that graph theorists have hard time proving. Can one prove statements about graphs that graph theorists cannot prove and actually want to prove? So I don't know. And I mean, there is, so one example would be a really nice conjecture that a graph can be covered by a planar graph. I, let me not say what covered. If and only if it embeds in the projective plane. So it's widely open, and lots of people tried it hard. And the same thing classically, topologically, is, is, is a result that's well known, that, any, that the only surface that admits a cover by a sphere is projective plane. Okay, and this is so this is it. Thank you very much.